So welcome everyone, welcome once again. Uh, my name is Carlene Gardner, and I'm the director of McGill's Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, or more so. And on behalf of all of us, I'd like to welcome you to the first session in our winter series called Did You Know? This series aims to celebrate the diverse faiths, beliefs, and traditions we find at McGill, and to take a look into the role that religion and spirituality plays on campus through the eyes of some of the most important people at McGill, which is, of course, our students. So before we dive into our topic tonight, I would like to take a moment uh, to recognize the land that we are on. McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. And we hope that tonight we will continue this long and sacred tradition of exchange, not as traders of goods, but as seekers of understanding. We honor, recognize, and respect the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet today. And if you are an immigrant or a descendant of settlers like me, I invite you to join me in reflecting on the long connection that indig Indigenous nations have had with this land and to consider how our own selves have been shaped by the lands that we and our ancestors belong to. By honoring these connections and by opening ourselves to learning more about our indigenous neighbors, may we forge new connections together and move ahead on the path towards reconciliation. Now for our panel tonight, uh, this Did You Know series ties into a couple of different areas of the work that Morsel does at McGill. First, it helps to increase the level of knowledge and awareness of different religious and spiritual traditions while honoring the internal diversity of each faith and the unique experiences and perspectives of each student. Another reason why this series is important is that it generates opportunities to get to know each other better, to connect with other students for whom their faith matters. And third, discussions like tonight's panel allows us to add layers and even more dimensions to religious and spiritual life as we witness the role faith plays in the personal and public life of students. So we're beginning this series with our first panel composed of some members of a few different Muslim student groups at McGill. And many of you may already know that the last week of January is Muslim Awareness Week in Quebec which began as a grassroots response to the tragic shooting at a mosque on January 29, 2017, that killed six men. Now, each year around this anniversary, events are organized to learn about the achievements, contributions, aspirations, and concerns of Quebecers of Muslim faith. And tonight's panel aligns perfectly with this goal of highlighting the achievements, contributions, aspirations, and concerns of students at McGill. We hope that as you listen to your peers, your fellow travelers in this journey through university studies, that you find connections with your own experiences and hopes, and that you come away from this discussion with an even richer view of the many dimensions of religious and spiritual life on campus. And at this point, I'd like to turn over uh, the, the floor to my colleague, Matthew, to continue with the opening remarks and introductions. Thank you so much, Kalin. Uh, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction and a brief description of this particular event. Um, my name is Matthew Bergen, as uh, uh, most of you perhaps would know by now. I am the programming associate uh, at Mosul. I am also a student at McGill, uh, a PhD student in the School of Religious Studies in my third year. Now, today we are so privileged to have so wonderful individuals who are going to um, help us unpack and uh, 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 inform us about and share the experience about their lives here on campus, uh, especially as students uh, of uh, the Muslim uh, uh, Student Association and the uh, um, TMA, as well as the Muslim Law Student Association. We have um, <clears throat> uh, six panelists today. We have Hadija Hamed, uh, who will be joining us later on uh, shortly who is the president of the Muslim Students, uh, Muslim Law Students Association. We have Asiya Siddiq, uh, who is also part of the uh, Muslim Law Students Association. We have Mohammed Yusuf Obohana, who is um, 
the president of the um, Muslim Student Association, MS, MSA. We have um, Saifali Lohandala, uh, who is also a member of the Takalayan Muslim Association, and Sarah Yassin, also a member of the uh, Takalayan Muslim Association. I'm going to um, invite them uh, to share, um, uh, introduce themselves. Please uh, let us know, tell us your name, uh, what you study, and what group you represent. We'll start with um, Saif Ali. Hi everyone, my name is Saif Ali and I'm, a, I'm an MA student in economics concentrating in uh, development studies. I'm also serving as the VP at uh, Sakhale Muslim Association. Uh, thank you very much for giving us this platform to share uh, the role that Muslim student clubs are, uh, are playing in at, at McGill. Thank you. Thank you so much Saif. Uh, let's hear from Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum everyone, or hi everyone. Uh, I am Mohammed Youssef. I'm in my last year of engineering and I'm here on behalf of the Muslim Student Association. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. What happened to, what happened to his face? Uh, let's uh, hear from Asiya. Hi everyone, my name is Asiya and I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Muslim Law Student Association at McGill, but I'm also um, president of the larger Law Student Association, and I'm really grateful to be invited to this panel, and I look forward to answering your questions and having this discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And now, uh, Sarah, welcome to Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a third year PhD student in electrochemistry in the chemistry department at McGill. And I also serve as the VP external at the Thakalayan Muslim Association, the TMA. I'm so happy to be with you today and would like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you so much. Um, and again, as I said, uh, Khadija will join us later on uh, as the discussion continues. Now, the nature of our, of our discussion today will feature uh, four areas um, that we will be looking into. Um, the first area is we will look into the history of the group. We'll also look into the mission and the focus of the group. What is the, the mission of the group? What does it seek to, to do? What is its uh, uh, objectives? And then also the challenges and the successes. Uh, what are some of the challenges that the group has faced or the groups has, uh, has faced, have faced all, over, all through the time since it was formed and even currently? We'll also be interested to look into how the group imagined the future uh, uh, 20 years from now. How will it be? Uh, uh, when they think about their, their different clubs. Now, my, my question uh, uh, goes, uh, I guess I'll start with um, the MSA president. Uh, and, and of course, th this is for all of us to, to attempt to answer that this question, the question about, about the origin uh, of this particular group uh, or groups. So briefly, looking into your group, MSA, TMA, MLC, uh, or club, how would you describe its origin? What inspired the formation of your group? Um, what made it come into being? Over to you, Mohammed. Okay, so in preparation of the day, I tried to look into it, tried to reach out to previous presidents before me. And um, it turns out that there's traces of Muslim associations of some kind uh, from the early 70s um, on McGill and in Montreal on campus. Uh, but if, if I may speak about the MSA specifically, we became more of a established club within the institution of uh, the Student Society of McGill University in the early 2000s. And it's mostly inspired by the need for Muslim students um, to convene together and to have access to basic um, services for them that they need to be able to be practicing Muslims, uh, but also beyond that, being able to um, use their time in university to grow spiritually and academically and become uh, active contributing members of the society. And also, finally, they also want the opportunity to be to represent Muslims on campus and to represent Muslims in a society that is not uh, mostly Muslim. Uh, it's a society that is um, many cultures, many, many, many people representing their faiths, and it's an opportunity to represent what you stand on and um, reach out to other people. Um, so that's what the MSA is. Um, we've been here for a while now, and uh, this past year we've been through a uh, resurgence. We've been um, big, we've uh, achieved another new status within the Student Society of McGill University, and based on that new status, we'll continue to serve, um, God willing. Yeah. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Um, that is really, really good. Um, I know that TMA, for instance, is, is uh, uh, an, I mean, MSA is an umbrella for all the Muslim students on campus, but TMA uh, has its specific history uh, as well. Uh, let's hear from uh, uh, our panelists from the TMA. One of you uh, should be able to. For sure, I can, I can start off with uh, mentioning a few points. So we don't really have much information of how TMA was formed uh, because we ourselves are, are a pretty new new board on which has taken up these positions. Uh, but we do know that McGill, the TMA has been at McGill for quite some time, for quite a long time. Um, now, what, what is our function really? So, so within Islam, just to start off, within Islam, we do have the two major sects that more, most of you are aware of. So the Shia and the Sunni sect, where Shias are a minority. So the last time I checked, I think we're about 15% or so of the Muslim population all over the world. As the TMA, our main aim is to provide a space for Shia students uh, by organizing events that are specific to the Shia community. And of course, for non-Shias and non-Muslims to know more about the faith, to, to know more about our culture and our history. And as you rightly mentioned, Matthew, we ourselves are proud of proud members of the MSA. And therefore, our role is, is to complement the work that MSA is doing. We are in no ways competing with each other. It's just to fill in the, fill in the gaps and to provide that space for, for minority uh, Muslim students. And some of you are wondering probably that what is Sakhalain? What is this word, Sakhalain Muslim Association? So Sakhalain is actually an Arabic word, um, which means two, two weighty things or two important entities. And it comes from a famous tradition of the prophet wherein the prophet said that uh, I leave behind two important entities, the book of God and my Ahlul Bayt, which is Ahlul Bayt meaning my family or my progeny. And that progeny comes from, from uh, Ali bin Abi Talib and uh, Fatima, who is the daughter of the Prophet. And then the saying goes on um, about how you should hold on to these two, two entities. So our inspiration really comes from that. And, and if you see all around um, the different universities around the globe, you'll find that there are there is a network of Ahlul Bayt Muslim society or Muslim association. So we're part of that larger network unofficially perhaps, but yeah, that's, that's where the inspiration comes from. That's really beautiful. <clears throat> uh, I, I I didn't know about the the, the two uh, the book of uh, oh, the book of God and the the other one was um, Bayt. So the progeny yes. of the Prophet or the family of the yeah. Prophet. That's beautiful. Uh, Yasin, do you want to add something to to, to this uh, discussion? Actually, I think Saif Ali answered all the like whatever I had in mind. But I was really happy that um, to stress also, and I think it's really essential to stress that. We are actually active members of the MSA, which we do proudly attend all of their events almost. And we do believe that it's almost the umbrella that gathers all the Muslims with all their di diverse like uh, sects or, or schools of thoughts among this club. So thank you for that emphasis. Uh, Asiya, your group is a little bit unique. <laughs> yeah, we're a very niche group. Um... And we're very new as well. I looked, I went back on our Facebook page to see when our first post was on Facebook. And I'll tell you the exact date it was. <laughs> so we published our logo on March 27, 2017. And that's like exactly two months after the Quebec City shooting or roughly about two months after. So I think that uh, that incident had uh, a large part in why we're here. Um, it was a big reason for, I think, why they started this group because, you know, we're law students and um, the law and, you know, especially with Bill 21, um, these issues affect the Muslim community in uh, disproportionate ways. So I think, and especially with the rise of Islamophobia and the hate, in society, um, the, the the shooting in us uh, was it New Zealand um, a few years back. Um, in the aftermath of all of these events, uh, students needed to have a group and a forum where they can where they can discuss the impacts of these events on the Muslim community in in Montreal, in Quebec, and in Canada, and in the wider uh, global community. And this is why we're here. We 
have very um, difficult topics that we discuss that are very, very relevant to in today's climate. Um, so we're here since 2017. Uh, it's been about five years now. Um, and, and as um, the other clubs mentioned, Thakalane, uh, we're also part of the MSA. I mean, I, I attend uh, the MSA events as well. Um, I also go to their prayer room that I, it's a very nice prayer room and I'm really happy that we have one. So yeah, we're kind of all part of the same um, community. Um, and yeah, thank you. Excellent. What I what I would what I'm interested also to 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 hear from you, Asia, is is uh, MLC part of SSMU? Is it part of PHSS? Uh, and so is uh, the other groups as well. Oh, so the Muslim Law Student Association is part of the Law Student Association. So like the the faculties student association. So we're not part of SMU, but we're part of the faculties student association, which is the LSA. And I'm president of the LSA, um, so so if ever we need like funding, we would go through the LSA, and the LSA is under SMU, so it's like SMU LSA and then MLSA. <laughs> that's the that's the hierarchy going on there. Nice, that's beautiful. So so devolved. <laughs> um, Mohammed MSA, is it part of SMU? Uh, let us know. Yes, um, so last year in 2020, uh, we passed from being a club of the Student Society of Mikkel University to a, to a service. And that, what that entails is um, a recognition first and foremost about uh, what kind of services we are trying to provide um, that are not necessarily just restricted to Muslim students, but they are open to everyone. Um, they do cater, of course, to the needs of Muslim students on campus. Um, we are a service under them and um, they provide us with resources, um, funding obviously, and uh, a space. So for example, someone asked in the chat, uh, where's the spray room that we have? Um, the spray room is in the basement of the university center building. It's, the, it's on McTavish Avenue. It's right on campus. Um, so thanks to SMU, we can have such a space where people can come for their five daily prayers. That's how most of people know us when they first come to Montreal, they like look for a place to pray on campus. And that's how MSA pops up. Uh, uh, we'll get to know through this panel that um, it's a bit more than just prayer services. Um, there's more services that cater to um, the education of people that are coming, let's say, for engineering or economics, but don't necessarily have the time to, um, to sit down and pursue a degree in theology or pursue a degree in Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, like jur 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 I, forgot, I forget the word, but um, everything related to the law and all that. Um, so it's an opportunity for people to go beyond the uh, basics of the daily life of a Muslim, like the prayer, and move on towards uh, something a bit more spiritual and something a bit more um, intellectual. And obviously, uh, thank you, Asiya, for mentioning it. We're all big, one big part of a community. SMU provides us with a place to be able to hold some events uh, that gather everyone, no matter their sect, no matter their, um, their level of religiosity. Um, they're there to... Uh, convene together and remember their tradition and remember their origin and remember their faith and um yeah it's a good environment to be in if you ask me <laughs> beautiful beautiful Saif Ali well, if you don't mind me jumping into this I think uh Muhammad you, if you could shed more light on I think MSA is also handling a database of of uh of prayer rooms on different parts of the campus and I think that was a very nice thing for me because I came in last year and I was able to see, okay, where can I pray? Where, where can I find a room to pray? So that was pretty good. Yeah, um, since we get that question a lot, actually, almost on a daily basis, especially at the beginning of the semester with new people coming in, um, one of the initiatives we did last um, semester is create a Google map where you have uh, different locations on campus and in downtown Montreal uh, where you can go to pray. Uh, for those that don't know, Muslims are mandated to pray five times a day at a certain specific times. And um, it's one of the most important parts of the day of the Muslim, and it's important that they do it on time. Um, so between two classes, people are usually rushing to try to find a place to pray. And sometimes like going all the way to McTavish, I have most of my courses up the hill in Trottier. Uh, going to McTavish every day is not, is not necessarily, when I have like a 10 minute break, is not necessarily the easiest thing. So there's other places around that I use the map to check. And some of these places have been with the help of McGill. I know we're going to get into 
um, later on about how we collaborate with McGill, but um, the um, Associate Provost of Inclusivity, um, Angela Campbell, helped us this summer create a quiet spaces that can be used by any uh, person to reflect um, whether it is religion or spirituality. And a lot of people have been using those spaces as prayer spaces, which is great. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. Um, is TMA part of the SSMU or is yeah. it? Yeah, yes, yes. sorry. So yeah, we are a part of the SSMU and we do have some student-student collaboration with other TMAs across uh, Mont, like uh, the universities in Montreal or across North America in general. So we do have some like collaborations and common events that we held together. But mainly we do most of the majority of our events on campus. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kali now. We'll proceed with our second uh, set of questions. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, everyone. It's, it's just really interesting to hear these stories of all the different groups and to see all the different ways uh, people are connected to each other, to campus life, to their faculties. Um, and of course, you know, we've gotten a bit of a, an overview picture, but, you know, there's also probably special things or projects that you're focusing on now. Um, of course, you know, from year to year, there can be changes, different priorities can arise, or different areas of focus that are of concern. So I'd like to hear more about some of the things that uh, each of you feel are close to your group's mission or something you really want to talk you focus on or talk about in today's context so and, and don't worry we're not going to be holding you to this it's really just to get an idea of how you see your group uh, organizing to respond to challenges or to meet different needs as they arise on campus uh, so if you can give us a few examples um, and it's perfectly okay if that's changed over time or if you want to talk about something maybe that you completed recently or something you're looking forward to. Um, I think everybody would be really interesting, interested to hear about that. So shall we start with uh, Asiya? Would you like to tell us a little bit about what uh, the MLSA is focusing on these days? So yeah, Khadija is with us now. So welcome. Um, oh, feel free to uh, jump Hello. in. Hello. OK, thanks. Um, Carlene, was the question um, specifically regarding this semester or what we've done in the past? It can be what's done in the past. It's just, you know, what are you, what, what have been some of the, I guess, you know, you know, maybe things that have interested or captivated your group and motivated you to, to organize or to create some programming around? Um, Mohammed talked a lot about prayer space, and I think that's often what we hear quite a bit of in in, you know, on campus in public parlance, but uh, we know that there's a lot more going on out there. There's a lot, uh, prayer is super important, but there's also a lot of other things that people are working on. So. Yes. Um, so actually at the Faculty of Law, we have one of these um, prayer rooms where people, where students from other faculties come. So I've met a lot of Muslim students coming to the Faculty of Law to one of these quiet rooms. And that's when I found out that these existed on the, the greater McGill campus. And it was really nice to see that. Um, so one of the, the main things that we've been involved in since I was, since I'm a student at the Faculty of Law and Khadija also in my year, um, in our first year of law school, we had a great experience being in person. So this was pre-COVID 2019, 2020. I remember the first great event that we organized was um, a protest against Bill 21. Um, it was organized in collaboration with the Faculty of Education as well, and we had a great turnout. It was freezing cold, minus 30 degrees outside in January, and we had so many people come out and protest against this horrible law. So Bill 21 is always... Um, a main issue that we talk about and that we try to um, spread awareness on because it's directly related to law and you know we're law students and Hadija you can uh, speak about um, some of the other initiatives that we've been working on. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I think you know it's funny um, I was racking my brain now to think about uh, the initiatives that we're drawn to um, since we started in law school. And I really think that Bill 21 takes a large portion um, of our attention. Um, I think 
just going back to what earlier what Asya said is that Bill 21 is a law and I think as Muslim women who are who are visible, visibly Muslim and members of the MLSA, I think we feel a unique responsibility to um, take up that initiative in whatever capacity. And um, I do remember that protest. And I think that was a really beautiful moment of solidarity because we also worked with the Rad Law student group uh, within our faculty of law. And um, we did like a McGill Law, like McGill Law Against Bill 21 Coalition. And that was really, really beautiful. And I think um, moments of, 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 of crisis, I guess, or moments of social crisis do bring uh, about beautiful moments sometimes just because you see community members coming out um, that may not be visibly impacted uh, for Bill 21. And so I think that has been such a beautiful um, spark, uh, an unexpected silver lining to uh, our involvement with Bill 21. Um, of course, We've done some other uh, activities that are more internal, um, like we've had opportunities for Muslim students to just come together and just be Muslim and not really the political uh, element of it. Um, so we've had, uh, last year we had, we had a virtual iftar. Um, maybe we could talk about this later on because I think there are some other questions that uh, you've, you've uh, posed to us that will touch on that, but um, I think our, external facing events really are Bill 21 related um, because of our unique um, position as Muslims and law students. And then internally, I think it's more so um, giving space to Islamic history, um, giving space to uh, us to gather, to, to have a thought, to break fast uh, when it's Ramadan. So those are the two elements, but I would say um, because we're a minority group <laughs> and meaning we are, uh, um, there aren't a lot of Muslims at the Faculty of Law relative to um, other non-Muslims. And so um, we do, a lot of our time is occupied by Bill 21 advocacy. There's also um, the vigil that we organized um, for the, you know, the, the shooting in Quebec City. Um, so when we were in our first year, we were in person, this was January. So about two months before COVID started. And I remember we organized this, you know, vigil and a lot of like over a hundred students of the faculty attended, the Dean attended. And it was just a moment where people came together and saw, we saw the solidarity and it was like, as Khadija said, a silver lining. Um, and I think it was really important for us to share that with our colleagues to see how much we were impacted as a community and how much this threat of Islamophobia is real. And um, it's you know we're the the anniversary of the fifth um, the fifth anniversary is like a few days away so I just wanted to speak to that and you know it's very difficult. Thank you for thank you for that, Asya. It's um, these uh, you know sometimes when we talk about clubs on campus we tend to focus just on events and activities but there's also that uh, community that sense of belonging. Um, that uh, nourishing and strengthening uh, and helping getting through the, the difficult um, phases of being a university student and also, as uh, many of you mentioned, being uh, in a minoritized population in Quebec. So thank you. Thank you for raising that. Um, I'd like to hear from, from Sarah and Saif Ali about the, what's been going on with the TMA and how, how you've been yeah. kind of organizing yourself these days? So before COVID, the number of events were much more like, because the situation was much better, um, the club was more like active. A lot of, um, again, the general goal of this club is to spread the message of Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet's progeny and household. So there is different types of like events that were being held. Um, some examples of this are the Faces of Faith, which was done with Dr. Shumadi. Um, he's from London. Um, the Multi-Faith Dialogue, which was an event that hosted two panelists, one which is a Christian priest, and there is another who is a Muslim. And to just try to highlight the common and the mutual thoughts between Muslims and Christians and other um, Megillian students and the communities. 
Um, one of the events which really like was interesting for me is the Mental Health uh, Matters, which focuses on the Muslim student uh, life balance, especially being in the college or at the university. Um, with all of these in mind, of course, there's some more specific um, events such as the facts and fiction um, of Ashura or some of the women of Karbala, um, such more specific and like focused events. Uh, meanwhile, uh, one like I would talk about my story, how I got to know about the TMA in on campus. Uh, so for us, um, the Thursday night is a very important night, mainly for all Muslims. And there's something very special that we do recite. It's called Dua Kumel. Um, this Dua is like very um, sensitive, and we really like enjoy. It's, it's very uh, high spirituality that we really enjoy reciting every Thursday night. So I've got invited by a friend uh, to the event of Dua Kumel on campus, and that was the best thing I ever like. Made me feel special coming as an international student coming from overseas. Um, to overcome all the like homesickness feeling, it made me feel that I do have a community, I do have, I'm actually very welcomed in here. And attending that event was something that was really helpful, uh, digging into the McGill's life. So we do have such um, events, which are done usually in the evenings on the campus. Meanwhile, with all the COVID situation. <laughs> COVID has certainly thrown us more than one curveball in terms of organizing events and gathering as communities. Um, Saif Ali, did you want to add something to what Sarah has uh, mentioned? I mean, Sarah has actually covered most of the points, but uh, as she mentioned, like TMA has been there for several years, but it was dormant for, for, for a year before COVID. And then some members took the initiative at the start of COVID and you know they started making the group more active. I remember I was still not in Montreal, but, you know, I joined in through Zoom. So that was one of the benefits that you could, even though I was not in Montreal, I was able to make friends even before I was not in Montreal. So I was able to speak to many people who were already in McGill, at McGill and in Montreal. So that's one of the, perhaps the silver, silver lining, as they say. So um, that's one part of it. And then if you look at the, the events that Sara mentioned, I think these events are not just specifically for Shias, they're, they're for everybody in the community, right? So we had an inter interfaith uh, dialogue as well. We had hist historical perspective on, on you know, the events of Karbala. So these things are, are for the general public. You know, it's not just for Shia students. Um, and that's what we try to do in our, in our events. So hopefully in this, in this year as well, in this semester, we're gonna try and uh, incorporate more such more of those events. Yes, super important to have those connections with community uh, and making friends in advance, almost like preemptive friend making uh, through Zoom before you come to Miguel. That's a good thing that uh, that we've been able to do with Zoom. Um, Mohammed Yusuf, yeah. the MSA. I know you're probably been scratching your head trying to figure out what what am I going to pick for this. Because I know your folks have been super active. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll be. I'll inspire myself with Sarah's story and tell you my own and how I progressed through the MSA and hopefully through my like my personal history, we'll come to see everything that the MSA does. Uh, so I came to Montreal not necessarily at first looking for a prayer space. I went to a very secular high school. I was not expecting to find a prayer space on campus, uh, so that was not what I was looking for. Um, I came in and I saw there's a Muslim frosh and. Before coming to McGill, I've heard all about Frosh and how it may not be suitable for me. Um, and I felt, okay, may, is there an alternative? And that's the first thing that I saw. I saw a Muslim Frosh where uh, Muslims have fun in their own way. They, we've went on picnics, we went on the, uh, on the canal canoeing, we went laser tagging, all those things. Um, so I came in and that's the first impression that I got of the MSA. It's a nice social club, let's say at the beginning, that's how it started. Um, I got that impression and it was very convenient because like Sarah and like Saif, uh, I was an international student and the first few days were kind of awkward. Like you meet people and you're like, oh, what do you do? And that's it. Like two minutes later, it's an awkward silence. Um, so on that day with, for Muslim Flash, I started feeling that, okay, there's some people that it's a little bit easier to connect to at first. Obviously now uh, you connect to everyone that you see later, but um, it was easier to connect and it was a nice transition into the uh, university life. And after um, being in MSA Frosh for a couple of days, I came to find about 
all the, the prayer recommendations that are available, which obviously was very convenient for someone who didn't have those accommodations uh, for the last few years. And then as I was going to the prayer space, I met some more people and they told me about upcoming events that the MSA was organizing in terms of charity. Charity is a central uh, part of um, the Muslim tradition and the Muslim uh, daily life. Uh, so they were organizing something called Project Downtown. Um, the MSA was like creating goodie bags for uh, homeless people in downtown and distributing them. Obviously now with COVID, that's been a little bit interrupted, uh, but um, that's the first thing that I engaged with. And then after the charity event came another type of event where it was more educational. Uh, first, I was like, oh, outside of class, I'm having enough classes. Why would I go to another class? Uh, but I've come to see that the programming that they provided at the time, and we're still hoping to provide, uh, I've come to see that, okay, faith is not just something that you practice on your own in your little corner and something that you blindly believe in. Uh, those classes helped me connect a little bit more with the academic history that surrounds Islam and how uh, traditions have been passed on and how people have thought about all the different questions that come up and not just taking things like blindly. Um, so that's the more education part of the MSA activity. And then obviously, as you keep on progressing and you keep on participating in the social, the community, the educational events, obviously at some point you're faced with situations like Bill 21, uh, like the shooting um, of the Quebec mosque, and you feel the need and you feel the opportunity to speak on those issues and to be a member of your society, not just in your little community. Uh, I know I mentioned at the beginning, it started me being in a small little group of froshies that we're having fun together, uh, but also, okay, we are here in Quebec, we are here in Canada and people are willing to listen and they should listen because if they don't, well, we've seen what happens with Bill 21 and the shooting. Uh, so you slowly progress towards the advocacy part of the MSA. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there's so many events happening, so many different initiatives. We've had to adapt a lot with COVID, obviously. Um, last semester, we were so excited to be back on campus to finally have our prayer services again, to have our iftar. I think Khadija mentioned that a little bit earlier for their group. Uh, uh, iftar is uh, the breaking of the fast. So it's a nice uh, communal dinner where everyone and joins together and shares a meal, usually after a day of fasting. Um, so yeah, MSA personally have provided me with a very rich experience on campus and uh, not only like rich in terms of experience, like social one, uh, but also I feel like intellectually and spiritually, it helps you grow. Um, with COVID, you have to adapt, people get some Zoom fatigue. So we have to try to think out of the box and try to organize stuff outside of Zoom, maybe out, on, off campus, but we, we still have to be safe because that's the responsibility. So it's been mostly trying to find a way, uh, play it by ear. Whenever something happens, we adapt. Uh, but yeah, like Saif mentioned, uh, you can, we had a lot of people that started their year last year and they were remotely, they were in the US, they were in uh, Eastern Asia, they were like in North Africa and um, they just joined on Zoom and they were able to meet people. And one of our VPs this year, one of the members of our team, I met him online and friendship started there without like, for me personally, before I used to like prefer meeting people in person and uh, like getting to know them in person. But no, with Zoom, we found a way. And when there's a need, uh, people react. So yeah, that went on a little bit long, but I hope that I gave you a little bit of holistic idea of what the MSA does. And it's beyond the prayer services. It's uh, a bit more um, intellectual and a bit more spiritual, a bit more fun as well, because that's important. We want to have fun in university. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, thank you so much. You, you're you helping us deliver on our prod, uh, on our promise. We made at opening uh, this session to say that we we're gonna add dimension uh, and layers to, uh, to religious and spiritual life on campus. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you to continue with our questions for our panelists. Yeah, it's so beautiful to hear these stories um, that you guys are sharing. You know, you know um, about organizing the events that you've had to to work together and as as various clubs. My question is, what are the what are, have, have you seen as the challenges that uh, as uh, as you know come alongside you in terms of um, uh, as you come to organize, as you start, as you you come to execute your 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 mission as a as a group, what challenges have you faced, um, Khadija? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I I 
I, it's kind of unfortunate for the other groups that I'm going first because I think that we probably have similar challenges. <laughs> um, but um, I would say one that's particular to the Muslim Law Student Association is um, retention and consistency. Um, and I think they go hand in hand. Um, it's, it's difficult because we are a small group and I think there are a couple of people in our faculty I recall last year when they realized how many people we were, which was four last year, they were really surprised. <laughs> they, re they thought that there were more of us because we just had a wider presence or our presence was felt in the faculty, which is amazing. But um, yeah, numbers are not on our side, um, mainly because law school is really intense. And I think people are very um, judicious, sorry for the pun, but like people are judicious in terms of their time. And um, I think being involved in community is a luxury that some people professionally may not be able to afford if, if they do have a life outside of law school and are working or have a family, it's difficult to juggle a lot. Um, so it's, it's hard to attract people to join and, and be consistently um, present throughout the year for all the events just in terms of the intensity of recruitment for law school classes um, other commitments like working at a legal clinic and so that kind of makes it difficult and kind of uh, uh, disappointing because I think a lot of us have come to law school to in some capacity serve our community um, and sometimes um, the difficulty of, of juggling everything means that we may not be able to dedicate or devote our time to community uh, building. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, I think one of our, our challenges has been attracting people and uh, to and stay. And it's not because they don't want to join. It is because it's, it's difficult to, challenge, to, to balance everything in law school, I would say. Um, but I think that's one of the things that comes to mind. And I think that might be a little unique in terms of the dimension of, uh, of law school. Um, if Asi has anything to add, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, it seems not to have anything to add. You do? No? Okay. Let's hear from Mohammed. What challenges have you had uh, as president of MSA, as MSA, in terms of organizing, uh, now that you lead a, a, a huge, a vast organization uh, of the Muslim Students Association? Uh, I wouldn't describe us as huge and vast, but um, yeah, uh, there come some challenges when it comes to event planning. Obviously, like I mentioned, all these big events, you um, like you can't undermine the logistical works that it takes to uh, plan some tickets, get some engagement, make sure that like you advertise the event so people know that it's going because like what benefit you put all the effort and people don't come at the end. Uh, it's, uh, it can be disheartening at first, but I've come to realize that even one person attending is usually more than enough because you've made them feel great and they've had a great time. So that's all that matters at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, like logistically speaking, I can go on and on about the difficulties of finding a space um, to hold an event or just finding a space for the daily prayers that's been. And uh, I'd say I'd say it's a struggle. Like we're best known for our prayer services, but it didn't come along easily. Like so many times we've prayer spaces have been taken away from us and we had to fight to get them back or like sometimes they're inadequate and we have to like try to find another way to to, to, to have them somewhere else. Um, so logistically speaking, there is some challenges, uh, but also I'd like to touch upon the retention uh, uh, challenge. Uh, for us, it's been a challenge, like there's obviously people come for like three, four year degrees and um, usually they're not going to be involved as an executive in their first year, but they're going to be like maybe there for a couple of years and then leave and there's a high executive turnover. Um, so the ch there's the challenge of like keeping the tradition going on and on like generation after generation. Uh, but beyond the challenge, I see it as also uh, a blessing. Um, the, the whole the fact that there's a lot of turnover, it means a lot of people are getting involved and the MSA is hopefully uh, fostering a place for leaders to to to, to develop and go somewhere else to contribute to their societies as well, not just like take away from the MSA and leave. Um, so yeah, it, it is a challenge. The, reten the retention is a challenge, but I hope, I'm hope i hoping that it's a blessing as well because I know some of the previous uh, VPs or execs that were are part of the MSA and they're still, um, they're like Calgary, Toronto, wherever they are right now or back home, wherever they are. Um, they are, they just took the tradition and kept on trying to contribute to their um, community and it may not be seen on the news, but they're still doing it, and that's a blessing for me. Beautiful, Yasin. 
What might you say about him? Eh? Uh, I actually second both uh, Muhammad and Khadija with all they mentioned. And we just wanted to highlight that uh, the COVID actually has been a bit harsh on the, I think, on all the clubs associations, uh, especially in our case, because we are minorities and it becomes difficult actually to be identified or to hold any virtual event together. Uh, usually one way we do advertise for our events, aside from the social media, the activity night that we do attend uh, that is organized by McGill's uh, at the beginning of each semester. We do actually reach out to some uh, community centers all among uh, Montreal or um, Laval or the like uh, nearby areas. But within these, they're, they have been closed for a certain part of time. And every time we try like to do some events, like in the fall, we were a bit like optimistic organizing some, planning some events on for these for the winter semester, but it wasn't as expected due to the COVID situation. Uh, so this would as well affect the recruitment of the members. But other than that, I think like things should be good. <laughs> you, you all have shared uh, very interesting stories, personal anecdotes that you have uh, highlighted. And I think those are very encouraging to hear. Now, as students, as members of, 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 uh, of a student uh, students club, that identifies with a particular faith uh, in a university that has a lot of students from and, and, and uh, non-students from various backgrounds. How has it been for you? What has been the reception uh, like for you uh, as students and, and, and going through um, your membership in this particular club? What has been the reception? So the way I interpret that, um, that question is how, like, the greater community receives the club, like the non- How has the, the, the rest of non-Muslims uh, received the club? How do they perceive the attitude, the entire community that is non-Muslim, yeah. Okay, so in the Faculty of Law, um, I think we're very well received and really respected um, because, you know, we deal with very difficult questions. Bill 21 is something that's very difficult and we're directly impacted by that bill. <laughs> so it's it's kind of, you know, we're, we're doing the heavy lifting and we're our, we ourselves are impacted by this. And sometimes I feel like, you know, we're, we shouldn't be the ones advocating for our own rights. Um, so people see that and they understand that. And I, I think they feel um, what we feel. And we've had a lot of good um, discussions with our, our colleagues in our cohort. Um, I know that um, before I entered law school, um, the MLSA um, hosted a conference where they invited um, Charles Taylor, for example, and other um, well-known figures in the community. And they had a panel on Bill 21 and they they're really proud of that because it was like a sold out event. The whole amphitheater was full of people. And uh, that just goes to show that people are very interested in these issues and uh, people uh, care and they want to come and uh, show their support and solidarity. So I think we're very well uh, you know, received in the faculty of law and just looking at the, the turnout in our events, for example, the vigil for the mosque shooting, um, hundreds of people came to that. And we're only like a few students who are putting these events together. That's why as Khadija was saying, people are usually surprised to see that, you know, we're only a few students, like literally like a handful, you can count us on one hand and they're surprised that, you know, we're so little and, and I guess, I mean, as Muslims would say, this is baraka, which means baraka means like abundance, and it's purely from God. And you know, we take no credit for this, and we're very grateful for that. So that's all I would say. And maybe Khadija wants to add. That was beautifully said. I I agree with everything that Asya said, and um, I'll just add that one of my favorite moments from last year after being completely exhausted of a full year of courses on Zoom and then doing exams during Ramadan, which was unforgettable. 
Uh, <laughs> and um, we were also trying to advocate for Muslim students who are not a part of the MLSA. And, I, you know, I actually, I was like, oh my God, we actually have so many more Muslims than I thought. <laughs> that, was, that was an interesting uh, moment to realize that. But then when we were advocating with the Student Affairs Office about getting accommodations for law exams for Muslim students, we also hosted an iftar, um, one of the first nights of Ramadan. And we had uh, a local member of parliament uh, say a few introductory words. The turnout was great. It was like 30 people, mostly non-Muslim, which was really, I think, uh, symbolic of the impact that we've had within our faculty is that people feel at ease and comfortable coming to join us to break fast virtually during exams to just, you know, to show up and to show that they care. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. And I think that is emblematic of our faculty and emblematic of the impact that we've had. And it, it almost feels very divine because it's just so beautiful to see that come together. And one of the other things I wanted to mention was um, through, I think the reception of how we've led the MLSA more recently, we've, we've created connections and with the other um, law student association religious groups. So the Jewish Law Student Association, as well as the Christian Legal Fellowship. And we've been hosting interfaith panels now. We've, we've, had, we've hosted multiple. And I think that also indicates this willingness to partner up uh, or to have partnerships, I think is indicative of the fact that people do feel comfortable working with us. And that is also really reassuring and positive reinforcement in terms of our space and the type of space that we hold within the faculty. Beautiful said. Um, I, I really am encouraged to hear that encouragement of non-Muslim students coming alongside. Uh, that's really beautiful. Um, Tara, what has been your experience? Um, so it's really nice hearing from the low students. Um, from my side, I actually, the best part that I really like is whenever we were holding the, um, the dua uh, on Thursday nights, we were having students who are non-Shia attending and just engaging with this. And this was for me, like, uh, as I mentioned, I'm international. It was the mainly almost the first time to see the non-Shia or the, somehow sometimes the non-Muslims attending these events and engaging in the discussion that we usually open after that. So when doing some discussion, some of them actually said that it was their first time to attend and to hear this dua and they were very amazed. Uh, from my side, that was very like uh, fulfilling and satisfying, and I really like the the spirit and in general. Uh, Saif Ali, would you like to add anything? Yeah, sure. I mean, so dua meaning a supplication. So dua is a supplication. It's an Arabic word for supplication, and I guess uh, the supplication is so it's just a human thing, right? It's it connects all of us uh, as humans. So irrespective of your religion or your ethnicity. And that's the beautiful, beautiful part of having uh, an event and having other individuals from other backgrounds and other religions come in. And it really helps to build these bridges between, between the different communities on campus. Um, yeah, just echoing on what, uh, what the rest of the panelists have mentioned, I think uh, when it comes to our peers, the staff and administration at McGill, they have been very supportive. I mean, I don't have much experience, but so far from the limited experience that we have had, um, everybody's been very supportive and open to knowing more about the work that we do. And just in general, there is a sense of collaboration and mutual respect, which is quite heartwarming. And this, this event itself is a, is a testimony to that, right? To that people are, are willing to know. Uh, and I re really appreciate the fact that there are, there are people who have taken, a, taken out time despite the Zoom fatigue and come for this, uh, for this panel discussion. So thanks a lot for the audience and for the organizers. Thank you. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you for uh, um, sending a word of appreciation to the members of the, and the public gallery. Um, thank you so much. Um, Mr. President of MSA, please. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll try to make it quick. Just two major points. Uh, first of all, like Khadija mentioned, um, I really love the bridges that are being built between our group and other groups. Um, in terms of interfaith stuff, it's become almost like a yearly tradition now to have a 
an event with Relevant McGill, uh, which is a, a, a Christian focus club. Uh, so we've had that before COVID actually the, the, the weekend of the COVID March 13, 2020 hit, uh, we were going to participate in a Shabbat dinner with a AM McGill, uh, a Jewish club. So I, I can see, I can feel the bridges building. Obviously we're very connected to Morsel. We've had more than a couple of events together and this one excluded. We've had uh, quizzes together and we've had so much fun together. Um, so the reception, I can see the bridges building between um, groups and something great. Um, the second thing is, despite the turnover that I mentioned earlier, uh, I feel like the name of the institution kind of stays, despite the people like going in and out of the MSA, uh, the name stays. And I've noticed that when we were going through some administrative procedures, um, the people at SMU were understanding, they were like, we, we understand your needs. We've, we've been here for like 20 years, some of the staff or 10 years or something like that. So they know what the MSA is about and they know uh, how we how serious the, the things that we demand are for us or like that we want or we organize how important they are to us and they become willing to help us and i've seen the same thing with the mcgill administration um and whether it is the associate um, the associate provost of inclusivity and diversity um or other deans who were willing to listen when we felt um, hurt by some of the words that were said by a few professors at mcgill um, it's made the headline recently, but someone wrote a, wrote a letter where they criticized and very unfairly they criticized like the veil that Muslim women wear, uh, the hijab. And when they, the, the dean of this faculty realized that we were heard, they were willing to sit down and talk to us and listen to us. Um, so that's something obviously we appreciate. I'm not saying it's like perfect, everything is good, but uh, at least there is a relationship there that I hope to continue, uh, which is also when you see it, you're like, okay, you feel the responsibility. People before me, I'm only here because people before us planted the seed and made sure that the name of the institution stays uh, like stays high. Um, so you do feel the responsibility to continue um, having that good reception on campus, whether it is from Muslims or non-Muslims or faculty or non-faculty and so on. Wow. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Kalin to continue the uh, final set of questions and then we'll introduce. Yeah, so thank you, Matthew. And thank you, everyone. Um, so actually, for closing, my I really just have one kind of question. Um, I want to also appreciate uh, all the interesting stories um, of the groups that are here and seeing this wide range of activity that you've been involved in. And you know, hearing the challenges, of course, but also seeing this energy and this potential, um, and all of you here tonight are are living examples of that. Um, so I want to kind of uh, look forward and uh, basically ask you, you know, to kind of create a little mental time capsule for us here. Uh, so imagine that it's it's far in the future. Let's say your twentieth class reunion at McGill. What would you hope to find on campus for Muslim students? And what do you think your group would be doing? What would it be like? Can maybe go? Uh, I've been going, yeah. Um, so something that I've discussed this with you personally, Carlene, um, something that I'm passionate about and that I hope to see in the future, and we're laying the foundation for it now, is uh, having a Muslim chaplain on campus. Obviously, this past couple of years, uh, everything's been remote. There's been a uh, heightened awareness about the mental challenges that people go through when they go through university. And not only mental, but mental and spiritual are so connected, um, especially for people of our faith. Um, they're not some things that you can easily like separate. And uh, while secular chaplain or secular like psychiatrist or something that can, can provide the help and it will be highly appreciated and it will be very helpful. I really want to see um, a chaplain um, that understands the Muslim background of people, but also is there to have the proper conversation about mental health and self-care um, engaged with the students. Um, so one of our main motivations to becoming a service instead of a club at, at the Student Society of Mingo University at SMU is because um, we are trying to, to get some more funding to be able to hire a chaplain, be there uh, obviously not full time, not like 40 hours a week, but at least like a 20 hours per week or something like that. Um, so not only we've been working on that ourselves, like trying to secure the funding, uh, but also some previous members of the Muslim community on campus and particularly the MSA 
um, who are our seniors, like together they created a foundation outside of McGill to help us um, find this chaplain and help us um, take care of the administrative procedures. Because like I mentioned, we're students at the end of the day and there's a lot of turnover. Um, so there needs to be like a rock solid foundation for such a big project because we're talking about hiring someone full, like to be there all this time. Um, so that's something that I really want to see. I want to see a chaplain uh, on campus and we're doing the work now. And uh, like we say, inshallah, God willing, um, uh, we'll have that in the future. Thank you for that. Uh, that I, I'm not going to call it a dream because it's in the process of becoming a reality. So we call it a project. <laughs> Um, I'd see Asya uh, or Khadija from the MLSA. Would you like to give us uh, your vision when you're 20 years into your law career coming back to McGill? What would you hope to see? Sure. Um, can you hear me? My, my headphones. Okay. Um, I was hoping to go last because I feel like all the good ideas, we could just build on that. Um, but um, I think one of the things that I hope to see um, are more Muslim students involved, just because I think, I think that for some students, they feel a hesitancy being involved with religious-based groups because of uh, fear of judgment. Um, and so one of the things I hope is that culturally we've reached a point where it's de facto considered a judgmental free space where people can come and be themselves and feel comfortable um, being Muslim, whatever that may look like for them. Um, so that's one one wish I have, and that's kind of an, an intangible one. And I and I think that could be indicated by numbers, hopefully, um, because I think that's one of the reasons why people might not want to join a a, a group. Um, and one of the things I hope for, I think, uh, in my mind, I think of the MSA as sort of like the heart of the Muslim. Muslim groups and I think um, on, on, on campus and I think that I, I hope that like we are able to um, have a strong enough connection in terms of their just sort of being consistent events or collaborations or partnerships. I know that with the with the MLSA, we, we've done annually and we haven't done one yet, but uh, an admissions uh, panel for students that are interested in law school. I think if anything, um, solidarity is so important, whether it is building bridges with groups that are not, uh, who identify as Muslim, but also with recognizing the internal diversity within Muslim groups, but also the Muslim identity. And I think that's super important. And one of the things that I personally hope for for the MLSA is that there sort of be that solidarity uh, with law schools across the country. We've been in contact with other uh, MLSAs across the 16 law schools that exist in Canada. But having that professional network would, I think, really set us apart. And I think that's existed and continues to exist for other uh, groups, other identity-based groups like um, Black Law Student Association, um, Women in Law. And I think it would be really powerful to have a similar thing for Muslims because I think a lot of our problems, the, the problems that our community face um, like Bill 21, which literally impact me and Asia's ability to be lawyers in the province of Quebec and our ability to pursue being a Crown prosecutor, our ability to pursue being a judge. So having that type of solidarity within the law school network for Muslims across the country, I think is a dream that I, I hope is going to become a reality. But it's, um, and I think one of the things that COVID has facilitated is our ability to, to interact with people more easily virtually. So I hope that that will be a possibility 20 years from now where we can talk to law students at UBC who are Muslim and uh, would want to know something about uh, Quebec law or Ontario law or something like that. So yeah, I guess in, in essence, sort of seeing internal solidarity and external solidarity with other groups would just be um, a dream come true, I think, and really good. Beautiful. Thank you. Asya, did you want to add a little bit yes. to that? <laughs> so this is like the part of the panel where we can dream big. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so Khadija was saying how it's really important for students to be authentically you know them in their faith and i think that's something that i think we're still 
are far away from getting there because a lot of people are afraid to be openly religious, whether Muslim or Jewish or Christian. And I and Carlene, we had this discussion a few months ago, and that's my dream. I, my dream is for people to be free in university spaces to be who they are and not afraid of their faith. And I think our clubs have a big role to play in that. Um, and I think in 20 years, my, my hope is that, you know, even though we're living in a secular society, I hope religion and faith will have a bigger role um, in all the like, in decision making and policy making and legislation and and I hope and I think this is where Muslims, Christians, Jews and all of these different faith based groups, we need to come together and build strong bridges because you know, we have, we're, we're, we're a minority among this larger, you know, secular society. And it's important for us to, to come together and, you know, be united because we shouldn't be afraid of being who we are. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of saying, I believe in God and I, I pray five times a day, you know what I mean? And I think that's that's my goal. And I hope that in 20 years from now, it will be easier for people to talk about their beliefs in university setting. If I can add just one thing. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I feel like I've spoken a lot, but I was late. Um, I would say on that point that Asya said, um, I really hope 20 years from now, we're not having the same conversations. I, I'm so tired of post 9-11 securitization laws regarding immigration, regarding, um, you know, flying while Muslim, the veil, we are constantly uh, put in a position where we are asked to justify our beliefs. And that's just unacceptable. So I really hope that the tone of conversation that we have 20 years from now will shift. And we're not having these um, capital O other Muslim conversations where we're we're constantly put on this on, on the stage to remind people of our humanity. It's just absurd. I'm so tired of it. So I really hope that, that we shift away from that dialogue 20 years from now. And I think it's possible. I definitely also think it's possible, you know, and we all have a role to play in moving towards that. Um, this this desire, this deep desire to live authentically is something I think that is catching on. Uh, with uh, our current generation of students. And I really hope that it, it snowballs and it grows and it becomes the norm, becomes normative to, to be yourself fully and completely while doing your studies and everywhere else in society as well. So yeah, thank you for, thank you for those dreams. And again, we'll call them projects because I think, I think they are doable. They're achievable. Um, Sarah. Yeah, actually, what have been so far said is uh, very ins like inspiring. Um, if I'm to add on to build on that, I would define my my hopes as in two. One regarding the student community, I would really wish to see unity within diversity all the minorities or the different aspects, like different uh, religion groups, um, spiritual groups, uh, coming together, doing interfaith events, uh, more dialogue, more communicating, uh, actual um, collaboration uh, on campus, uh, not even within the Muslim community, but even with other non-Muslims and other religious or spiritual, or even neither. Um, on the campus, like accepting, discussing, debating, and building up together the community. And if I am to think about things that McGill might be uh, taking part of as an administration, perhaps uh, raising awareness on Islamophobia, but in a more uh, in, a, in action. I won't say there's a lot of Islamophobia on campus, but things still happen. And maybe having um, a course or something that would introduce people on what, how to behave. There's a lot of, of things or myths that are being shared on 
um, on the media that doesn't really represent the students and the Muslims or the community. So maybe having something really clear, a platform or something, how to introduce the non-Muslims to us to be more, because we're very approachable, we're very friendly, and we're doing our best, all the effort we can do to meet them at the midpoint. I really hope they're doing something just to uh, engage with us. So maybe having some uh, real laws or uh, regulations that would prevent not only limit the Islamophobia and to further on the opposite side, promote the Muslim community as part of the Magillian one. Um, aside from this, like on personal uh, level, I would actually hope for some more halal options on the campus. Uh, especially if someone is actually not around Sherbrooke, there's um, and in the winter, it's not very feasible for them to pick up some food. So maybe some more um, kiosks or options with the uh, halal and not only vegetarian would be perfect for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love your um, your range of desires, Sarah, going from the very lofty to the very practical. What's for dinner? <laughs> Uh, uh, Saif Sali, would you like to chime in with your... Well, I think those were, those were great points. I don't think I can put it in better words than what the rest of them have, have, uh, have mentioned. So yeah, just broad, broad themes of collaboration and accepting acceptance for different groups. Wonderful. All right. Well, we have come to the end of our prepared questions. And now is the time to turn over um, the floor to our participants, to our audience, to see if you have any further questions. And I think, Matthew, you had maybe some starters you wanted to, to work with. Yeah, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing and speaking uh, your hearts out. I really appreciate that. And uh, um, really beautiful in the way that you put it. Um, for various, various groups that we've been able to hear today, um, just to, to begin, and this is this is a startup question. Uh, people in the gallery are are, are are free to ask questions now. Um, how has COVID uh, impacted your groups? I mean, I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, some of our members who are also in the in the audience. So Hussein, our president, is also there, and uh, our former uh, former member of uh, TMA is also here, Sukten. So he's an alumnus, and thanks thanks for taking our time. So I'll, I'll let Hussein answer that uh, because he's been more around, uh, you know, taking the club forward as the as the captain of the ship. You know, he's been uh, leading everything. So I'll let him answer this one. Sure. Yeah, thank, you, thank you for the kind words, Saif. Yeah, uh, I think for the TMA specifically, because we uh, restarted after being inactive for a while, uh, basically in like February 2020, right before COVID hit, uh, it's been quite impactful. And I think uh, some of the panelists touched touched on it before, but not just holding and like retaining membership, but trying to attract membership in like a virtual format has been, you know, quite difficult at times. It's a, we're a minority community, so there's also less of us here at McGill. Um, but alhamdulillah, like we have been able to, you know, form a bit of a, a team, you know, a, a strong base to work from and Safe and Sada, uh, two examples of people who came on board during COVID. So we have been able to find like uh, sort of like a, a committed membership to plan events and form the executive during COVID. But uh, hopefully in the coming months, uh, you know, fingers crossed, we can uh, start to, like we have also held in-person events as well. Uh, I think Sada was talking about the Doha Kumeid ones earlier. Uh, but yeah, that, that's our hope uh, in, the, in the coming months is to sort of expand and like increase the membership base. But yeah, to answer the question, I think COVID's impacted it a lot uh, and it's made it more difficult, but um, yeah, hopefully it gets better. I can maybe go next. Um, so yeah, uh, COVID ironically speaking, took our most known service. It took away our prayer services because people can't convene in personal, like in space in person anymore. And, uh, even when we had shortly like last semester we had the room open up again we had to like comply by uh some regulations of how many people per room and stuff like that um so COVID did take away our flagship service but it also gave us room to innovate in the other services that we aim to provide uh we've been trying to maintain engagement with the community through quizzes on our instagram it's a new initiative that we started recently i invite you all to go follow on instagram and interact over there 
um, and we've been trying to continue our education mission. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the MSA is not just a social club. It's uh, we're trying to show um, Muslims who may not have the time to take an Islam class or an Islamic studies class, or may not have the time to like uh, deepen their knowledge in terms of what has been done academically speaking in, in Islam. Um, we've had a bunch of different classes and we're going to continue having them uh, God willing. Um, so yeah, yeah, stay in touch for just because you mentioned it, Carlene, stay in touch with us on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, we also have a newsletter. Uh, we Everything we do is on our newsletter. So make sure you go on our Facebook, click on the sign up button and you'll find our newsletter. So yeah, we've been also trying obviously to engage socially online as well. Uh, despite the Zoom fatigue, we, we've tried some game nights here and there. Um, Frosh, the event that I held so preciously in my heart because that's how I got to know the MSA. In 2020, we held it online and we had one of our exec like give a virtual tour of campus and um, just using all these new platforms. And like uh, Khadija mentioned earlier, we've learned how to like engage virtually and there's there's no more that barrier. I look back and I remember like now I can send a Zoom link to anybody and that feels normal. But before like calling someone felt very private. Uh, why would you do that? Uh, so yeah, um, COVID definitely, definitely brought a lot of challenges, but when there's challenge, there's room to innovate and to create something new. So I'm grateful for that. And maybe the MSA will be better just because of that. We'll see. Khadija, uh, do you want to say something about? Yeah, um, I was, that was really well put, Mohammed. like in terms of innovating. I will say that, honestly, considering our really intense schedule sometimes with uh, <laughs> law school, I've been low-key very grateful about Zoom. Um, and it just makes event coordination a little bit easier because finding space in the law faculty, promoting, and then uh, you know running around and just catching up with people if you see them is, is a lot to juggle. So uh, just like jumping from class to straight to an event has been um, easier. Um, one of the things, one of the events that we put on last year during Islamic History Month in October was an event with a, an Islamic uh, historian by the name of Tamim Ansari, who wrote Destiny uh, uh, Disrupted. And um, that would have not been possible if it wasn't for Zoom, that's one thing. And so that was really, really cool. Um, and uh, another event that we were able to put on with a uh, member of parliament that is now advocating for uh, the declaration of genocide against Uyghurs uh, in Ottawa by the name of Garrett Jake Genius joined us for a panel on learning about what is happening in the region uh, last November. And so that was also incredible and not possible necessarily without um, uh, it having a virtual space. So honestly, it's been really, really uh, uh, a blessing, surprisingly, in terms of being able to bring together people uh, more easily and people that wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily have access to, but are all incredibly um, uh, inspiring in, in, in their fields. And so that's been really great. Um, and yeah, but I guess the, the downside has been attracting members, as was said earlier by Hussein. And so it's, it's been hard to get people, but we've been able to have a presence online and that's been great. And we've been also able to, um, live stream our interfaith panels and so that's that's always great and um and looking back at them now uh you know i think for many of us covid feels like a blur of time <laughs> then we forget all the things that we've done or participated in so it's kind of nice to be able to look back on these virtual events that were, that were actually recorded and maybe would not have been had they had they been in person and uh reflect on some really important conversations that we've had like um, the B panel that we had in, in last semester, Carolyn, that you were able to participate in, which was um, women of faith in law. And we had um, lawyers, uh, women lawyers who are of Islamic faith, of uh, Christian faith, and of Jewish faith uh, speak about what um, it meant to be a spiritual person within the law. And so they're all they were not based in Montreal. <laughs> um, one was in New York, another person was in Ottawa, um, and one person was in Montreal, but I don't know if she was in town at the time. So being able to come together in community, um, in warm community, is just such a reassuring uh, thing to do in strange times like the pandemic. So um, Zoom has been surprisingly good for us, I would say. <laughs> and so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, any group that uh, would want to say something about the impact of COVID, uh, 
uh, before I ask uh, members of the gallery to ask a question. I might just jump in here for a second. And for our participants who might not be following the chat, we uh, our panelists have all put uh, at least one social media account in the chat. So if you're interested in connecting with them more and finding out more, uh, either how to get involved or, or what's on their agenda in the coming weeks and days, um, please do uh, check out those links that have been graciously dropped in the chat. So, thank you. Any question? Raise up your hand and then I will ask you to, or, or put in the chat, someone will read it. Yes, um, yeah, I can pronounce your name, Jalasi. Ethar Jalasi, yes. It's Ethar. Ethar, okay. Yes. Go ahead. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this presentation. And uh, it feels so good to be among you, actually. <laughs> um, so, my question is the following it's for mainly for the presidents of the asso different associations uh, i saw for example for msa you have upcoming events like the book club and uh, i i registered for that but i still didn't get the confirmation email <laughs> so i want to know the upcoming events for different events uh, how it works right uh, well thanks ether for your comment uh, the book club has indeed started, but it's not too late for you to join. Um, so if you would like, please make, uh, send me your email again in the chat and um, I'll ask one of our VPs to follow up with you. And yeah, the book club is uh, very cool. We've attended the first session and it looks like we're going to learn a lot of new things. So looking forward to seeing you there. Um, and everybody here, if you're interested, uh, just make sure to see our newsletter. Like I mentioned, we only send one email per week. I, I swear we won't, I, I promise you, we won't like spam you with the email. Uh, so it's just one email per week. It will have everything that we, uh, that we do uh, from education to social to community to um, the two events that we have at the end of this week in commemoration of the Quebec shooting. Uh, one of them is online. So I would love it if uh, all the people here attend as well. Um, you can find all the details on our Facebook page and yeah, so more, there's so many things happening. So I, I can't summarize it. I think Matthew has like also other questions, but I'll be sure to follow up about the book club. Any other group with, um, anything coming up soon that you want to share? I, we don't necessarily have uh, an event, but I would say, I just want to flag that on Friday, there will be that commemoration that, uh, will be hosted by McGill administration and the MSA. And I think it's really important that we, um, take some time to reflect on the, um, what has happened uh, five years ago in Quebec City, but also to remember the family that was lost in London, Ontario in May. In May. And Islamophobic attacks are happening day to day, whether they're as egregious and as heinous as we hear about um, in uh, the news or not. And I think, uh, I really hope, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat, but I, I hope that people are able to spare some time this Friday uh, at 2.30, whether it is to attend the event or have a moment of silence for the lives lost. Thank you. Thank you. There was a, an unraised. Is it Hussein? Hi, yeah. Uh, if yeah. I can be so bold as to tag a, a member of my own group in, uh, we'd asked uh, Septain to come along. He's a, he's an, uh, a McGill alumnus um, and he was involved in the TMA before. So as Safe mentioned, like where the three of us, Safe, uh, uh, Sarah and I are all members of the new iteration of the TMA. Uh, and we don't know that much about the prior history. So we thought it would be a good perspective for him to come in and, and share uh, what the TMA was like before uh, it went inactive. Okay. Yeah, no, just talk about a little about TMA. Even me, um, when, I, when I was in McGill, I think I was in McGill in 2014. Um, it was kind of similar to, I think, why a lot of people here joined uh, there's their own kind of groups is finding like a, a niche of students that uh, you connect with very instantly. So, um, I mean, you know, being, being Shia, uh, I mean, um, it was, we're always kind of a minority. So it was, it's nice to, to kind of join the, join the university and then be able to find like-minded students right away. So I, I heard of the club through, um, through a friend of mine who was uh, involved in the club at McGill at the time. And, they kind of were like, hey, you should join and, and kind of, uh, you know, be a part of it and, you know, try to get programs going and stuff like that. And the, the history kind of is, is basically that. It was just, you know, a, a, a few students 
um, who came together who were like-minded, yeah, you know, uh, Muslims. And they were like, hey, there's this, there's this bigger MSA group, but, you know, there's, and there's, they have awesome events, but there's certain events that cater, cater more to us too sometimes that we like to have within ourselves and then eventually try to co collaborate with other groups. So that kind of came together and formed, formed TMA. So then we started having more programs, you know, catered around, you know, um, the Shia narrative and stuff like that. And then, um, and then that came into a bigger umbrella of have, in, having interfaith events and then uh, bringing MSA and stuff like that. And, and I think we're still working. And I think the history is still evolving in the sense that uh, now with the, we're trying to work more and more to get integrated better with MSA and other Muslim programs. Because I think we were such a niche that we kind of, uh, it wasn't like anyone's fault, but we kind of stayed that way. And I think we were, we're still needing to kind of get the message out there better and be like, hey guys, let's you know get MSA involved in some of our programs and be more involved with MSA programs. And I think Sarah Hussain and Sefali and stuff are doing a great job with that. So, um, and yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really just uh, some students coming together and, and wanting um, some, some brotherhood in there. And then, yeah, that's how kind of TMA came, came into shape. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that history. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you for attending this uh, session as well. Uh, well, before we, we close out entirely, I will just maybe um, sort of uh, pique your curiosity to continue along with Morsel in this series. We are going to be hosting a similar panel with uh, Jewish students because like Muslim student groups, there are many Jewish student groups on campus. And we're also going to be doing the same with um, our multiple Christian groups on campus. So um, look forward to some um, some news from Morsel on when those panels will be. We're still ironing out the dates, but our plan is to host a, a Jewish panel in February and a Christian panel uh, in, in March. So uh, we hope to keep these conversations going. Um, and yes, I think uh, we're pretty much ready to wrap it up. Um, of course, I, I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing um, so generously of your own stories and your visions. It really means a lot um, to have these uh, direct experiences. Uh, it's really the best way in my mind to, for students to connect with other people, um, to not connect with some vague monolith, but to actually have people uh, that are in your classes that you might walk by on campus. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing so much of yourselves uh, with us tonight. And um, I think maybe I'd like to give our, our panelists the last words if they want to do a basically a checkout or a sign up. Any final words you'd like to, to leave our audience members with who have also been extremely generous with their time and have stayed with us for, for over an hour and a half. So thank you, audience members as well. As you, as, you, as you wrap up, uh, maybe you can also speak to this. Uh, if there's a non-Muslim who wants to, you know, get involved with you guys, can they? Maybe speak They're to more than welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're actually very approachable, very friendly, I think. Just talking on the behalf of all the Muslim friends I've met on campus, I feel they're all very, like, uh, friendly, lovely and they would be very open to do any discussion, answering any inquiry if anyone is actually in need. You can always stop us if you meet us on campus. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, on the social media accounts, and we are actually more than happy to, uh, to bound. Yeah, come talk to us. You'll see the excitement is real. Just getting to know, <laughs> know some of you and getting um, the interaction. After all, we are here in a um, place of seeking knowledge that's what university is it's about it's not also it's not just the knowledge it's also like forming experiences that you go on with for the rest of your life um, so I appreciate like all of these people here they probably have like midterms classes things coming up you taking time uh, is from from my perspective the true testament to what a university is it's not just about the classes the information it's about the knowledge uh, the human and the societal knowledge as well uh, so yeah thank you everyone for 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 all your time and thanks to the panelists it's been a pleasure to um, get your perspectives as well and uh, Matthew and Carlene all your events I've been attending most of them and I've been always having a good time I've won some gifts in some of them too so yeah keep keep up with the morsel events you can win a gift card or two 
Um, and yeah, thank you. I, I, will, I will keep it short. Thank you. And uh, may we continue to collaborate together. Inshallah. Yes, just wanted to echo thanks. And uh, uh, Carolyn, you've been such a instrumental uh, connection for me. And I just wanted to say thank you especially to you because you've been consistent in terms of uh, showing up and really being um, like walking the walk, you know, and, and being uh, that beacon of light and leadership. So thank you so much to you and thank you to more so more generally. And uh, thank you, Matthew, for uh, hosting this panel. Um, and thank you to uh, my co-panelists. I've, I've learned a lot and I hope uh, our groups could continue to work together. Um, and you are more than welcome to reach out for the MLSA for anything, of course. And uh, thank you so much again. This is, it's always really special, I think, when um, people with, this, with similar intentions come together and that's always beautiful. So thank you. Yeah, lastly, thank you very much, uh, Carleen and Matthew for organizing this and to the entire Morsel team along with the co-panelists. It was inspiring, it was enlightening as well. Thank you to the audience for taking our time. And we, will, we hope to see you in our events very soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that concludes our first Did You Know panel of uh, winter 2022. Uh, thank you again uh, on behalf of all of us to our panelists and to our, our guests in the audience. We look forward to seeing you uh, at our next panel and, of course, on campus. And we hope that tonight has inspired everyone and created a little bit of a spark to keep knowing and keep learning more as we continue through this journey. So wishing you all good health and good fortune and good luck in your studies. May you be well. Good evening, everyone. <laughs>